Well, hello there. It is Sarah, host of the GSMC Book Review Podcast, which is about to start in just a couple of minutes. Before we start, I would once again like to talk to you about Linens and Hutch and their amazing bedding and the amazing deal that they have going on for that bedding right now. As I've said before, if you go to linensandhutch.com and use the promo code GSMCBOOK during checkout, you will get 70% off of their entire website, plus free shipping. That's pretty amazing. 70% off and free shipping on all of their sheet sets, which includes some fabulous bamboo sheet sets, all of their reversible down alternative comforters, their quilts. Their quilts are beautiful, very simple, very um, classic. All their colors are very classic. I think if you are looking for some new uh, bedding, this is definitely the opportunity to go and check this out and get a great deal. If you're thinking about Christmas presents, this is a great t- this is a great deal. So definitely go to linensandhutch.com, check out their amazing supply, and you will receive. off plus free shipping when you use the promo code GSMCBOOK at checkout. Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. Welcome back to Sarah is Behind and Trying to Catch Up. Um, I Let's see, updates. I did go to the urgent care last night. I know you've been just dying to know. Um, I did go to urgent care. I do have a sinus infection, and as it often does, sinus infection brought its little friend bronchitis to play, so yay for that. As usual, when I am feeling like this, I will apologize for any heavy breathing that I might do during my speaking parts of the episode. Um, I do not have COVID. Hooray, hooray. Because of my symptoms, they did do a rapid test, which was not surprising. So I got a cotton swab shoved into my brain. It actually wasn't that bad. I Just when it started to get to the point, I was like, wow, how much further are they going to go? It was over. And then I just felt like I needed to sneeze for several minutes so not bad when I talked to my mom after I went um, I talked to my mom today and I was telling her about it and I said instead of cotton swab I said q-tip and she thought I said teacup (laughs) she was like how did they shove how and why did they shove a teacup up your nose I was like well I don't know a neti pot is kind of shaped like a teapot and I use that often um so yeah you gotta love bad cell reception when you're (laughs) you're trying to tell a story so I did not in fact get a teacup shoved up my nose I did in fact get a cotton swab shoved up there and um rapid test came back negative so it was a good trip to the urgent care despite, you know, coming home with sinus infection and bronchitis. But I pretty much already knew that I had a sinus infection and bronchitis was a a definite possibility. So enough about that. Let's talk about books. Today, as I mentioned in the end of the last episode, I am speaking with Lydia Kang, author of Opium and Absinthe. That's her most recent novel. There are two other novels, as I mentioned also in the end of the last episode, that are um, these are all standalone novels, but they have characters in common um, th- or or common threads. They, they take place in, in different eras, so not not necessarily characters in common, but definitely some um, 
some crossover aspects. The other two are The Impossible Girl, which takes place in the 1860s, 1850s, shoot, I can't remember now, and uh, A Beautiful Poison, which takes place in 1918. I have since listened to both of those on audiobook, and they are very interesting as well. Um, Opium Opium and Absinthe is the one that takes place in the middle of those two. It's uh, set in 1899. Now, I will say that A Beautiful Poison was a little weird to read for me because um it it takes place during the spanish the spanish flu right and so there are signs about wearing masks and there are all these the the stuff going on that very much reflects what's going on today and it was a little strange you know it's kind of like hmm is this the best time to be reading this particular book but I enjoyed both. My mom has since read all three, and so we've had some good book discussions on that. But we are mainly here to talk about Opium and Absinthe, as that is the newest book. And the description of that book is as follows. New York City, 1899. Tilly Pembroke's sister lies dead, her body drained of blood and with two puncture wounds on her neck. Bram Stoker's new novel, Dracula, has just been published, and Tilly's imagination leaps to the impossible. The murderer is a vampire. But it can't be, can it? A ravenous reader and researcher, Tilly has something of an addiction to truth, and she won't rest until she unravels the mystery of her sister's death. Unfortunately, Tilly's addicted to more than just truth. To ease the pain from a recent injury, she's taking more and more laudanum, and some in her immediate circle are happy to keep her well supplied. Tilly can't believe, bring herself to believe vampires exist, but with the hysterica, hysteria surrounding her sister's death, the continued vamp- vampiric slayings, and the opium swirling through her body, it's becoming increasingly difficult for a girl who relies on facts and figures to know what's real, or whether she can trust those closest to her. So that is the description of Opium and Absinthe. It is pretty obvious where the opium part of the title comes from. You'll have to listen to the episode to hear more about uh, the absinthe part of that title. I love that Lydia took a specific time, 1899, you know, right before the turn of the century, a specific fact about that time that uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula had just come out and kind of wove that into her 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 narrative and we talk a little bit about that in the book so you have these vampiric slayings and Tilly is <sighs> rationally she doesn't think that it, it's a vampire right but she's also addicted to opium she's taking a lot of laudanum and that is not helping her cognitive log- logical brain to sort through this so there's that aspect there's the uh, you know that she's trying to figure out what really happened to her sister so you have that mystery you have three women living in a house Tilly lives with her mother and her grandmother um, before obviously before her sister died she was living there so it's a house full of women and in this time period that involves some very specific roles but they are very um, strong opinionated impassioned women they just happen to live in a time where you have to use those skills a little differently than you might in another time period. So let's go ahead and turn now to the interview with Lydia so she can talk more about her book. Again, it is Opium and Absinthe, and the author is Lydia Kane. Let's turn now to that interview. Hi, Lydia. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having me. I am very happy to have you here today. Um, we are here to talk about your new novel. It's called Opium and Absinthe. Before we get to the book, though, if you could share a bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Sure. So um, I am um, an author of um, adult historical mysteries. Um, Opium and Absinthe is my most recent one. I am, I've also written The Impossible Girl and A Beautiful Poison. Um, I also write young adult fiction, including The November Girl, Toxic, and Control. Um, and I also write um, uh, nonfiction. So my, our, my most recent book that I have co-written with a friend of mine um, and journalist Nate Peterson is Quackery, A Brief History of the Worst Ways to Cure Everything. And that came out um, in 2017 with Workman Publishing. Um, 
I am also um, a physician. So I work um, at the University of Nebraska um, Medical Center. It's also called Nebraska Medicine in internal medicine primary care. And I've been doing that for quite some time. I think I've been in practice for um, about 20 years now. And um, I live with my family in the Midwest. We are we are not here to you know talk about the book Quackery, but actually that sounds fascinating. <laughs> I would I, I can only <laughs> imagine I can only imagine. I mean I, I know some of the things that have been tried and used throughout the years, but I can only imagine what you have included. Yeah, well you know Quackery has um, basically talks about all of these really strange things that we used to do to take care of ourselves in the name of. Um, good medicine that, in retrospect, are just terrible, terrible ideas. So things like lobotomies and using leeches to help cure melancholy and doing things like, um, you know, bloodletting for a fever. So all those things that, you know, you've maybe seen in the movies or read about here and there, we talk about all those things. And interestingly, um, I actually got a lot of inspiration from that book for my fiction. So it's come in really handy. All that research has like really peppered its way into a lot of my historical fiction because the time periods do overlap quite a bit. I was just going to say, yeah, that um, that sounds like it would have been very helpful because there's a lot of um, medically related things in opium and adsense that we would look questionably upon today. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of that came from my research for sure. Yeah. So give a brief overview of um, opium and absinthe. So opium and absinthe um, takes place in 1899, right before the turn of last century. Um, and it surrounds a main character named Tilly Pembroke or Matilda Pembroke. And Tilly is, is this young lady, um, very curious. Like she's the kind of, she's the kind of girl who, would spend 24 hours on Wikipedia just going from article to article reading about everything because she's inherently incredibly curious about the world and how it works. And she's socially awkward and um, she's the second daughter in this very, very wealthy New York family. And um, when we open up the book, she is actually um, trying to do some writing out in Long Island and has a terrible accident and she breaks her collarbone. And um, as she's sort of um, just barely recovering from the break, she's told that her sister went missing the same day that she went riding. And um, it turns out her sister w is found murdered um, in, uh, in the shadows of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And um, she has two puncture holes in her neck and was completely drained of blood. So it looks like a vampire slaying, which is so strange. And um, that year, 1899, was actually when Bram Stoker's Dracula was released in the United States. And so people were sort of thinking about vampires. It was um, it was kind of um, kind of not trendy, but you know, people were reading about it. And so Tilly is left with this this question of what or who killed my sister, and how can we stop them? And um, as she's recovering from her, her bone break, she becomes increasingly dependent on opium and morphine um, to soothe her pain. But also, really, she uses it in a way um, to sort of numb um, a lot of her grief. And she's dealing with this, um, this opiate addiction as she's trying to uncover um, you know, the truth about what happened to her sister, all while dealing with the confines of being um, a young woman at the turn of the century who really has very, she might be very wealthy and privileged, but she also is very much restricted. So um, she does enlist the help of a newsie that um, there might be some romance going on. She's not really sure what's going on there. And these little newsie kids that also she befriends. So it's, it's, a, it's a fun sort of romping story from a, a long ways back that includes a lot of history, some real world um, people, um, and real world um, events that happened at the time. Yes, and I have so many follow up questions. I am actually not quite sure where to start. <laughs> I mean, um, <laughs> let's start with the time frame. So, 1899, and 
was your did you start with that time frame or did you kind of start from the perspective of that the year Dracula was released where did you where did you start this process to to create this this story in the time that it's in so that's a really really good question and it's like it's actually a question that I like to ask other historical fiction authors too about like why did you pick this time period because you know there's a lot of fiction that takes place in World War II it's a very obvious place to start because there's so much going on um, so many stories that can be told during that time um, for me uh, I had mentioned that I'd been inspired by what happened um, with my research in quackery and one of the things that I had researched at the time was I was interested I was responsible for writing the chapter on opium and all the ways that opium has been used to treat a lot of medical problems um, that opium really shouldn't be treated because it's, you know, it's a painkiller and it's addictive and has some terrible side effects. Um, but as I was doing the research, I found out that number one, um, the hypodermic syringe was invented in the mid 1800s. And that two, once they had isolated morphine um, and were using morphine for injections, a lot of times that it was being given to people, not really for the best reasons, but interestingly, the people who could afford to do morphine injections tended to be very wealthy because these syringe kits were these hand-blown glass metal contraptions and these beautiful sort of walnut cases. And you had to be pretty wealthy to be able to afford um, injectable morphine. And oftentimes there were these um, women who were being over-medicated because of what was called hysteria at the time, which was a sort of catchphrase term for, um, you know, what they called women who had problems with their nerves or anxiety or, you know, any kind of problems in their, in their body, they would just sort of blame it on hysteria. Um, and which comes from, um, you know, the, the word for hysterect, you know, the, the womb, basically the uterus and like mm -hmm. how the uterus basically wasn't behaving itself well. And so people would actually treat them with things like morphine. So what was I the thought, line? Well, I'm sorry, there was there's a, there's a fabulous line that that Tilly quotes about her her womb running around inside her creating mischief or something <laughs> along those lines yes, that she read exactly. in a in a book. Yes, and that yeah. that is that's taken almost directly from um, the research on hysteria, which is that people thought that the womb was this wandering organ in a woman's body, and if you didn't pin it down and it didn't sit there and behave, it would cause all sorts of mischief. And so throughout time, people would think, well, you know, if I just, like, here's how you can tell, you know, if the womb is causing problems or, or, or how to deal with a, a wandering womb that's causing problems. Like, if you put bad smelling things up by a woman's nose, it'll chase the womb back down to where it's supposed to be. Or, you know, you can tempt the womb to go back into place by putting, you know, pleasant smelling things <laughs> down by her nether regions. It's just unbelievable some of the things that they thought were attributable to this wandering womb problem. And so that's why Tilly says that because she's heard about it and she thinks it's ridiculous because she's a very factual, factually based person. She likes to think in terms of what's real and what isn't and she likes to do her research. And so when someone, you know, when her doctor's sort of like, yeah, this is a case of hysteria when she behaves badly, she's like, my womb is not wandering and causing mischief. And of course, her exclamation <laughs> basically buys her an injection of morphine in her leg because she's not behaving right. well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we could spend multiple podcasts just talking about hysteria and the ways it was treated and some interesting things that came out of the ways it was treated. I mean, there's a lot we could cover. Um because it's a fascinating topic, but, but <laughs> yeah, it, it was fascinating. And I think like, you know, for, in terms of the story, you know, I kind of um, hooked onto that as a means of showing readers, like this is how women were controlled back then. You know, sometimes they were controlled pharmacologically and they were contro controlled in a lot of different ways, but it was around that time that, you know, women started to look for more independence they were working more they were getting outside of the house and it's interesting that sort of this hysteria thing kind of um was coinciding with also trying to tamp down um the power that they were realizing that they had and that was something that you see in tilly that she starts to become a lot more um brave about questioning the world around her like why is it that there are all these poor children who have to work for a living why is it that I have so much money and other people don't. So um, so it's this interesting sort of clash between 
um, her wanting to exercise her ability to really think through things and the people around her are trying to um, keep her oppressed. I do need to jump in here and take our first break of the podcast, but when we come back, Lydia and I will be talking more about the roles of women and women's sort of um, place or sphere in this particular society, in this particular era. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Uh, Before the break, Lydia and I were speaking about women and how they functioned and or were controlled in this particular time in society. And so we're going to pick up more on that conversation as we get back into the interview. It brings up more conversations and questions about women's roles at that time because she is surrounded by women um, with her her sister dies early in the book, but, you know, she has her sister, her mother, and her grandmother, and her mother and her grandmother are very strong women, but they have the same confines. They have to act within the sphere in which they reside. So you get this whole interesting, all all the power dynamics that go on in their family, but still within the context of being a woman in this time. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, they have, they are working by the rules um, by which they were raised and that they have to live by. Um, you know, survival for a woman was, was difficult. And if you were wealthy, it was all about, well, how am I going to continue to be able to take care of myself? How am I going to make sure that I, um, you know, my own daughters are going to be okay? And so a lot of this was cruel, um, the way that they treated her, but they were also very much concerned in um, the survival of their species and the survival of their family lineage. Mhm. So let's talk a little bit more about Tilly as the main character. Um she's very it, the the book starts with her writing a letter to Nellie Bly, the reporter at the time, and you get a very good idea of her personality in that letter <laughs> because one of <laughs> yeah. the main things she wants to know is um how smelly are elephants basically. <laughs> um, but I know. She, I, it's so funny. I just it just randomly came out of nowhere because you know Nellie <laughs> Bly had written this big article on elephants in, in the circus, and um and I thought, well, you know, if Tilly read that article, what would she come away with? And she would be like, well, I want to know more. I want to know everything. Like, what's it actually like to be there with the elephants? And so that letter was the letters that Tilly wrote to Nellie Bly were very easy to write because they were just just really playing on that sort of curiosity aspect that she has that she just cannot suppress. Right. But they also show her progression as a character because in the, in the beginning you can tell she's very curious, but also not like she's very smart. She's done, she asks a lot of questions, but she's not, maybe not the the most aware of the world as, as a whole. And as, and as her, the book goes on and the, and her letters go on, you can see how she's becoming more aware of the realities of the world around her. Yes, exactly. It's sort of this um, catch-22. The more you learn about the world, the more you realize that it's incredibly imperfect. Um, and so she was in this, in this very protected bubble, and she she breaks through that um, that fear, as you said. Um, and there are consequences to that. You know, being aware of these things brings pain and also responsibility. Yeah. So um, what about Tilly do you think is maybe going to resonate with readers? 
I think um, I think Tilly is a very modern character in a lot of ways. I think that people are going to see a lot of themselves in Tilly in that um, the kind of exploratory um, journey that she goes on, I think is something that everybody goes through. At some point in time, you are a sheltered, innocent, young person. And the more you learn about the world, the more you realize that there's a lot of ugliness out there. Um, but you also become curious about um, about things and you question things. And it's part of the entire process of becoming an independent, functional adult, you know, is really questioning authority, um, being able to practice your own authority, and being able to question, well, why are things the way that they are? Why, um, why are things um, done in such a way that, you know, some people are... Um, are just really at the short end of the stick and cannot be fixed? Or, you know, why is it that I have to dress this way and, you know, um, act this way in public? So every every aspect of her entire existence comes into question. And I think a lot of people see that cells in them because they went through a lot of the same things as they um, became adults. You know, some people, I think, do really fall into the, they just want to live exactly the same lives that um, they were brought up to believe is, is the way things should be. But I don't think anybody does that and doesn't question at some point in time, like, does it have to be this way? Can I do things differently? And if I do, um, you know, what are, what are my terms? And this is Tilly just trying to figure out what are the terms of her existence and how she wants to do things. And she's being told very, very clearly, this is how you have to do it. Um, and she, you know, at some point in time, she has to decide, am I going to put my foot down and decide I'm going to live my life the way that I want to or, or not? Am I going to take the safe road and be unhappy or am I going to take the, the freer road and, and risk everything? And it's a, it's a question I think a lot of people have to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I loved about the book was the multiple genres that are, are present in it. You get historical fiction, you get women's literature. Um, there's, there's a bit of a paranormal aspect or supernatural aspect in it. You get literary fiction mm -hmm. because Dracula pay, plays a huge part in the book, uh, the book Dracula, not Dracula himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> did you set out to write um, a, a novel that, that crossed multiple genres or did it just sort of come, come about as you wrote? It just, it kind of came about as you wrote. And it occurs to me that I didn't actually answer your earlier question about how did I pick 1899? So, um, so going back to that question, which will hopefully answer this one as well. Um, so when I was doing the research and learning about morphine and, you know, these young wealthy women who are being, who are becoming morphine addicts um, in the late 1800s, I knew that I was going to write a, a character that was going through this um, situation because I thought it would be a really interesting lens on today, sort of showing how, um, you know, opioid addiction isn't always thought of as, um, oh, you know, there's these terrible people out there who are like abusing drugs and, you know, they're, they're you know, morally corrupt and that sort of a thing. And I wanted people to see that like, no, it really can happen to anybody. Um, and actually you'd be with, you would be surprised that it happened, it had to happen to these, you know, rich white ladies in the late 1800s. So I knew I need, needed to pick that period of time. And um, one of my, one of my kids is super into musicals. And she was listening to the Newsies soundtrack um, all the time. And so I was listening to it and I was sort of getting interested in the story. And I said, huh, well, when did this Newsies strike happen exactly? You know, how fun would it be if I included, um, you know, some Newsies in my story? So I went into Wikipedia and I, I looked it up and it turns out, you know, the Newsies strike happened in 1899. So then I thought, wow, it's the right time period. It would fit in with, you know, where all my other books are. And so I started looking at well, what else happened in 1899 that's interesting. Like what else could I put into my book? And um, looking through the timeline of events in 1899, there's like this one little line that says Bram Stoker's Dracula is released in, in the United States. Um, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's perfect. And I thought, what if the murder mystery surrounds something that is vampire-like, but you don't actually know if it's truly a vampire or not. And somehow the newsies are helpful in trying to figure out the story because there's news involved. And then I was looking into Nellie Bly, and she was sort of just past her heyday, I think, in her career. She was sort of still around. 
And I thought, I'm just going to smush these all into a book and I'm going to make it happen somehow. And so that's how it came to be that all these really various genres kind of smushed together um, into a story that, uh, you know, in the beginning, I was like, I don't know if this is going to work, but somehow, somehow it did. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's really fun. I mean, just the fact that you could kind of tie all of those things together that might seem fairly disparate. One thing that is then interesting is not only is Tilly addicted to the laudanum and the morphine, but it she's also obsessed with the book Dracula and those things kind of combine because one of the side effects of the laudanum is that it can cause increased paranoia or um, I don't want to say hallucinations, but uh, just a more vivid imagination or, or trying to, you know, make sense of things that might not make sense. And so she's, she's very curious, but she's also under the influence of the op op the opium Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, opiates, if you're not using them correctly or they're too strong, you know, can, can induce a sense of euphoria and definitely cause your ability, your consciousness becomes altered. You know, you can get sleepier or sort of just more woozy on it and that sort of thing. And it can affect the way that you think as a result of that. And we see that multiple times in the book where she's under the influence and she's really just not like acting like her normal self. Um, and I don't want to, you know, give the impression that that was one of the reasons why she was able to solve the mystery. If anything, it was really the opposite. It was like, despite her addiction, she still managed to get the answers that she needed to. And she probably might have gotten there earlier if she hadn't been on the medication. Um, but yeah, you know, I one thing that people <clears throat> who are writing books and stories and stuff like that will, will say over and over again um, is like we sort of throw the kitchen sink at our main characters sometimes. Like we really put them through the ringer and we do not make things easy on them. And I'm, I sort of did that. I wasn't very nice to Tilly. I really just, I wrecked her life in multiple, <laughs> in multiple ways. And I, and I just put obstacles um, left and right that she had to get through. Um, because, you know, as everybody knows, you know, a story that goes smoothly and perfectly for the main character is not really terribly exciting to read. And so, um, so I wasn't very nice to her. I, I did I did make her really fight through a lot of things um, to get the answers that she was looking for. You're so mean. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I am. We all are. We're terribly mean to our main characters. <laughs> so you did a lot of research for the book, obviously. Um, are there any sort of autobiographical elements within the book? I would say. Um, I, there's a lot of Tilly that is very similar to me and to my husband and my kids. Like we're all, we all tend to be pretty curious people. Um, but we are the kind of people who will like, if we're on a walk somewhere and, you know, a caterpillar is like crossing the trail, we will all stop and get down on our knees and we'll be like <laughs> staring at the caterpillar, trying to figure out what species it is and where is it going and does it need to be saved and, you know, are the hairs on the caterpillar going to make us break out in a rash if we touch it? So we we will sort of um, get completely just entranced with the natural world around us and ask all these questions like, what what is it? Where's it going? What's what's going on? Where where's it from? What species is it? And I that's what there's a lot of that in Tilly. Like in the on the first page, I think like the um, I think it's Roderick, her um, her groomsman, uh, the stable groom, the 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 groom at the stable, excuse me. <laughs> um, he's sort of like, yeah, you, you'll like spend hours like just like watching ant hills. I'm like, you know, you, you've got to get it together and act like a lady. And I just sort of laughed at that when I wrote it because I was like, yeah, that's us. That's like my family. That's like what we do. So there's a lot of us in her, that natural curiosity about the natural world um, that we put in there. <laughs> I love that because now I have this image in my head of being out for a walk and rounding a corner and finding a, an entire family like down on their hands and knees, rear ends in the air, <laughs> staring, mm -hmm. you know, intently yeah. at the ground and being like, I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but 
but I, I, I love that you, you can, you're, you're all curious. So it's not just like you and your husband are curious and your husband and your children are over there rolling their eyes going, Oh, good Lord, here they go again. No, it's like, it's pretty much most of us. And like we have different variations on where our curiosity will pull us to. But, um, but yeah, no, we're all like, we all are nature lovers and, um, just curious people who like to ask questions about things. So, yeah, so that wasn't too hard. That wasn't a very a far stretch for us, I don't think. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the cover art because it is beautiful. Um, did you have uh, any any real say in the cover art, or I'm I'm never sure how that always how that all works with publishing and cover art yeah. and authors. Yeah, so the cover, um, you know, the how much um, input an author has over the cover really varies from publisher to publisher. And I have been extremely lucky in that my publisher, Lake Union, has always um, had me be very, very involved in the process. I'm just so lucky. Like early on when um, the book is sort of being worked on, they'll send me, um, you know, a, like a form to fill out that says, show us a bunch of book covers that you really like. What elements do you want on the cover? What kind of colors are you thinking? Are you thinking like a person's face or images or do you want like the words to be a certain way? So they give, I get a lot of input up front. And then as they start putting mock-ups together, um, they ask for my feedback just sort of like every step of the way. And so I think I had said pretty early, like it would be great to have opium poppies on the cover because they're beautiful evocative flowers but then they're directly related to the story i said you know maybe an, maybe an absinthe bottle or at least an absinthe spoon which is like a really beautiful it's part of the story um and they're these gorgeous spoons and i thought that would be really cool too um and so uh when the story when they started putting the 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 cover together i also had mentioned like you know um, a beautiful poison has a very black and gold cover and um, The Impossible Girl has a very um, sort of crimson and purple cover. So I said, let's go in the green direction because um, maybe green and red, just so, just so that the covers all kind of stand out from each other. Um, and, that, and they said, sure. And they put something together. And I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And we kept tweaking things and tweaking things. I changed the absinthe spoon. I changed the flowers so that they were a little bit bigger, a little bit more realistic looking. Um, we changed like the font. I was incredibly um, involved in, in the cover of all three of my books. And so I'm just super pleased with how, how they turned out. Um, I think I saw somebody mention somewhere, I don't know if it was on Twitter or Instagram, they were just like, oh my gosh, this author just keeps hitting it, like hitting like the, the book cover lottery with these books. They're so beautiful. And I'm just like, I'm super lucky that they have come out exactly the way that I um, that I wanted them to, and they've just been absolutely perfect for the stories. They, like, match just right. Time for our second break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be speaking a little bit more about these two books that, haha, book and opium and absinthe. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm on antibiotics. <laughs> Let's go ahead and take that break, and when we come back, we'll be talking more with Lydia Kang about her novel, Opium and Absinthe, as well as the two novels that surround it, A Beautiful Poison and The Impossible Girl. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Podcast. 
just as a reminder before the break, Lydia and I were speaking about the two other historic novels that connect with opium and absinthe, and they are The Impossible Girl and A Beautiful Poison. And so we're going to continue that conversation a little bit now as the interview goes on. I, I actually thought when I was on your website that you can tell that it's the same author, but they they aren't the same cover. I mean, like, they have similar... They have similarities, so you can tell that, the, that you know, maybe maybe there's something similar with these, and it turns out that it's the author. But, uh, yeah, the, the covers are really cool. Yeah, and they are – so each of the books is um, – they're standalone books, so they are not sequels. You can read them in any order that you want to. But they do have um, some things in common, and so I like that that thread pulls them together, both like one visually you can just look at the books and sort of know that they're all kind of like – like sort of related to each other. And um, in the books themselves, you know, they all take place in New York City. Um, they are all historical um, mysteries that have this sort of medical or scientific or chemistry sort of bent to them. And um, they all have members of the same family threaded throughout the books. And so um, you'll see um, in um, Opium and Absence, um, you know, Tilly is a descendant of um, the main character in The Impossible Girl. And then um, you'll find out that there are characters in Opium and Absinthe who are actually the parents of um, Aline Cutter, who is the main one of the main characters um, in A Beautiful Poison. So the Cutter family just sort of weaves its way throughout the novels, um, but they don't, you don't have to read one before the other in order to um, to enjoy them. And I actually did technically write them out of order because I wrote A Beautiful Poison takes place in 1918. The Impossible Girl takes place in 1850. And Opium and Absinthe is 1899. So I'm completely writing them out of order. And yet I'm, I'm trying to weave that little bit of um, sort of uh, that common thread throughout all of them. So, so we talked about where opium comes into the title, but we have not talked about the absinthe part of the title. Um, so can you talk a little oh. bit about how that plays into the story? Right. So how absence got into the title. So this is a completely random thing. Um, one of my favorite movies from the 1990s is um, Bram Stoker's Dracula by Francis Ford Coppola. So that movie came out, I think I was in. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, that movie came out when I was in college, I think. And, you know, Winona Ryder's in it and Gary Oldman. And it is, when it came out, it was just such a striking movie. Like, um, the way that they had portrayed Dracula and the way that they had portrayed like Mina, um, I just really loved how they did it. And they, um, there was a scene in the movie where um, Dracula and Mina are in the salon and they are, they're actually drinking absinthe together. And absinthe was an extremely popular um, libation at, um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, and I've always been sort of obsessed with the the concept of it because you don't just drink absinthe. You don't just like order a cocktail and they give it to you. Like there is an, there's this whole ritual of how you're supposed to drink it that I thought was really, really beautiful. And I'm not even a big alcohol drinker, but I just thought this was just so gorgeous. You know, you have to, you put a little bit of absinthe at the bottom of this special glass that has a reservoir at the bottom. And then you put a spoon on top of the glass and a sugar cube, and then you drip ice cold water onto the cube, which dissolves through the slots of the spoon into the clear green absinthe liquor. And as the cold water and the sugar and the liquor mix together, it, it becomes cloudy. So it's like magical transformation in order to drink this. And a, a lot of the people who were huge fans of absinthe at the time were, um, were these huge you know, leaders in, in the art world, um, in the visual arts, um, Henri Toulouse-Lautrec and, um, you know, all these amazing writers. So you know, Edgar Allan Poe, there's like a gazillion of them that were just like big fans of this. And so I thought I really right. wanted I to bring I that sort of, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Did you hear me? No, no. I was just going to say I keep thinking that I keep I keep thinking of that scene in Moulin Rouge where you know it's these very creative types, and then they decide that that then they they go hit the absinthe, and Kylie Minogue shows up, and she says, "I'm the Green Fairy," and I mean, like there's a whole yes, and it, yes, that is exactly. And they used to call it the Green Fairy because they were like, oh, not only does it maybe sort of mess with your mind a little bit, but it can make you. They, they claim they, they claim that it could sort of increase your creativity. And so, you know, there is a scene in the movie where they're drinking absinthe and it is not in the book. It's just not in the book at all. It's just really something that they decided to do for the movie and sort of illustrated one of these sort of cultural mores of the time. And I was like, I really want to put absinthe in this book. I got to figure out a way to get this in this book. And as soon as I thought of absinthe, the title just popped into my head, opium and absinthe, like these two you know, um, these two elements that you could use to sort of alter your consciousness and they each have their own sort of kind of history, rich, rich history and mystery and um, that that edge of dangerousness to them that I wanted to put in the book. And so I had the title before I had any idea how I was going to put absinthe into the story. And so I I like shoehorned it in. I was like, I'm going to make absinthe part of the story. I'm going to make it a major clue in the book. Um, and that's how, it, uh, that's how it happened. It was because I was influenced by something that was culturally a big thing at the time and from the movie. And I just, I was like, I want it in there. I, I love it. Um, and at one point, I think Tilly is using an absinthe spoon as a bookmark, although she doesn't know what it is. <laughs> Which you know, yeah, kind of because you know, she's, she's right, totally. exactly. I and mean, she's like so <laughs> protected that she's like, she doesn't even know what it is, and she's like, What this is like the strangest thing, and I don't even know how it's kind of funny how like dictionaries are very useful if you know what you're looking at, but if you don't know what you're looking up, you don't know how to find it. And I think that's what the absence spoon was. She was like, I don't, I don't even know what this is, and she couldn't ask anybody in her household right. about it because she didn't want to get in trouble. Um, so yeah, it's kind of funny. I now have several absinthe spoons in my house, and um, I've I've only had it like once or twice, and it's really strong. And I don't like I don't want to say I don't think I love it, love it. I think I need to like find a cocktail that I'm going to sort of turn into my favorite like absinthe cocktail. But um, but yeah, it is. I, I have done the whole ritual with like the absinthe and the spoon and the sugar, and it's super fun and and kind of fascinating. But um, yeah, but I'm not like, I'm not actually a huge fan of it because <laughs> I'm just not like a big cocktail drinker. I just never was. Um, but it doesn't mean I can't be like sort of obsessed about it. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I had another author on um, a while back and her book was set in the 1920s in Chicago. And so she actually tried out the recipes for a lot of 1920s cocktails. <laughs> oh, so she had a, oh were yeah, they so, good? Well, she said some of them were and some of them were not. <laughs> okay. But, okay. But it was a very interesting form of research. That is really, really funny. Yeah, I think like I um researching the time period is always so much fun. It's like incredibly enjoyable, but it's also fraught with it's very time consuming because in order to get a feel for the time period, you can't just like sort of read a book and get everything that you need. You have to find out like more about the language how did they read how did they not how did they read how did they speak you know um, what kind of words did they use for certain things how did they dress what were the fabrics called how did they get around what was their transportation like um i mean it wasn't as it wasn't even as simple as sort of like oh like some people were using horse and buggy still and some people were using automobiles but like you know if you like literally stepped outside of your home like how did you get the horse and buggy there like how did they know where were the stables like all those things like you have to ask these questions about how things function not necessarily that you're going to put them all in the book but they have to sort of make sense so mm -hmm. that was a that was a huge amount of work just to get that all in there but the food part oh that was so much fun like just sort of looking up what um the foods were at the time like they had this thing called the mandarin cake that was like amazing and um the kind of salads that they would eat and soups and things like that. So um, I think at some point in time, I, I don't know how I came across this. I think I was, I'm obsessed with food movies. So I love watching movies that have anything to do with food. Um, and I, I think I just found this um, one story, not a story. It was actually um, nonfiction about um, putting together like a Boston Fanny Farmer 
um, feast from like 1899 using the actual stoves and cookware and everything from 1899. And it is done by the people who do like the America's Test Kitchen. It's like an incredible, incredible story. I think I found it on Amazon or something like that. But like, they're basically like sweating their brains out in this hot kitchen, making these crazy dishes that nobody eats nowadays um, under extreme circumstances. And I was like, yeah. So I did steal a couple of those dishes and I put them in the book. Very fun. And you know, if it's done by America's Test Kitchen, it's going to be very thorough, (laughs) very detail oriented. Yes, exactly. It's got to be, it's got to be very, very thorough. So, (laughs) and it was, it was an incredibly satisfying, like little, um, uh, little short movie to watch. So um, I'll have to see if I can find the the name of it. But um, so, yeah, but the research is is a lot of fun, but it is, it's definitely time consuming. There's no question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are you working on now? So I am actually currently working on a follow-up to that nonfiction book, Quackery. Um, Nate Peterson and I are writing a book called Patient Zero, which are all about sort of pandemic stories and people affected by pandemics throughout history and the the story behind pandemics and how they got started. Um, We actually got the idea for the book that we sort of generated along with our editor before this whole COVID thing even started. So it's just weirdly timely, timely that we're writing that. And then I am also writing um, a fourth historical book um, novel. And it doesn't have a title yet, but it takes place in World War II. And it involves um, the Manhattan Project and the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So that is another one that I'm writing that will hopefully be out in 2021. All right, thank you for that. Uh, there, we've talked about a few uh, of your books, but are there any 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 of your novels that you would like to highlight? Obviously, sure. So, so an, an absence. yeah, um, if you are a fan of um, historical fiction and you like opium and absence, then for sure you should give a try to um, a beautiful poison and the impossible girl. So, like I said before, they are all historical fiction mysteries. They all take place in New York and they have this thread of the same family in them. Um, A Beautiful Poison takes place in 1918. And so it is right in the middle of the influenza epidemic, excuse me, the influenza pandemic. Um, They called it Spanish flu at the time. Um, And it's also at the beginning of um, the New York City's office of the chief medical examiner opens at Bellevue Hospital, which is where I did my residency. And um, there's a character who works there and you get to know some of the pathologists there while they are trying to deal with, um, you know, solving a mystery. And I also put a radium girl in there. So, you know, it's a young woman who's working in a watch factory who's slowly being poisoned by the radium that she's using to paint onto the dials. And so it's, uh, again, one of those sort of like um, lots of rich history, just but with characters that are just trying to make their way in the world and figure out how to survive. Um, And then The Impossible Girl takes place in 1850 in New York. And it is about um, a woman who actually um, is a resurrectionist. And so she works, um, pretends to be a man uh, during the daytime or rather the nighttime um, when she procures bodies for medical school. And one of the reasons why she's doing this is because she is, um, one, it's a way to make money. And two, um, she herself has uh, was born with two hearts and knows that um, these like anatomical museums would do anything to get hands on her body because they would make a lot of money from her dissection. And so she sort of keeps her finger on the pulse of that entire industry. Um, and, and that is what that story is about. So again, a lot of bit of medical history in that one as well. Thank you. Last break of the podcast, and when we come back, we'll be continuing those follow-up questions that I love to ask in terms of writing and what kind of books my authors like to read and all those questions that I just like to be nosy about. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Pets bring such joy to our lives, and the GSMC Pets Podcast is here to share in that joy. We'll tell stories of pets finding their forever homes, acting in unexpected ways, being helpful, or just being silly. Whether you love dogs, cats, llamas, reptiles, fish, 
or you've never met an animal you didn't like, the GSMC Pets Podcast is for you. of my interview with author Lydia Kang. Is writing something that you've always wanted to do? Did you come to that realization later in life? How did that work for you personally? So it was a very um, weird road for me to get here. So when I was a kid, I was a serial rereader. Like I would, I had this pile of books in my house, small pile of books, and I would reread the books over and over again. And um, and I remember trying to write something like in third grade and it was terrible. It was like a paragraph long. And I'm like, I can't, how do I turn this paragraph into a book? I have no idea. So I kind of gave up. And, um, you know, I started to write in journals when I was in high school that my English teacher had encouraged us to do. And I started journaling more in college. Um, and I remember I took a creative fiction um, class in college and I just wasn't one of the best writers there either and I just kept getting this sort of message from the universe like you just don't know what to do with this you're not very good at it but I was really good at science I was like you know I loved biology um, and my dad is a doctor and it occurred to me that I could help people and you know really explore science together in medicine and so I decided to become a doctor so it wasn't until I'd been a doctor for a couple of a good couple of years that I started writing essays about being a doctor and essays about patient care. And those turned into me writing some poetry, which then turned into me um, joining a writer's group once I moved to um, the Midwest. And it was only then, so I had been in practice for like a, well over 10 years that I suddenly decided, I'm just going to try to write a book. I This could be a terrible idea and this could be a terrible book, but I've always wanted to do it. I want to try to do it and I'm just going to dive in. And I I basically self-taught, like I learned everything I did. So much of what um, of my writing just came from reading blogs and websites about, you know, how to show, not tell, and how to, you know, write beautiful turns of phrase and how to create worlds and write three-dimensional characters. And, and it, it all started around, you know, 2009 is when it started. And I wrote a couple of books and it was my third book that um, ended up getting, I got an agent and got published in 2013 and it was young adult so I started out in young adult and I branched off into adult later um but it it really just started with me kind of giving myself the permission to be like just because you're like you think you know you don't have a degree in this and you're not meant to do this for your entire career doesn't mean you can't try and give it a shot and um it, it took me a long time to really give myself permission to even to try to do it and, and push myself and then and I'm so glad I did <laughs> Yeah, I I am too. Way to persevere. Um, do you do you then have um, advice for aspiring authors? Um, I do. I think that um, a couple things is definitely read a lot and find out what you like to read and find out what what's out there. I I, I think it's important that if you want to write something that you you are sort of comfortably well-versed in what you're what you enjoy so I've had some people come up to me and say hey I really really want to write young adult fiction um but I don't really read it very much and I'm like well that's a terrible idea <laughs> like why would you want to write about something where you don't actually enjoy reading those books um so yeah. that's one thing it's kind of very obvious but in, in, for some people it's not second thing is um be willing to know that you're going into this and you have a lot of improvement to do so I went into this knowing very well I'm not an expert in creative writing I have so much to learn and so when I did get feedback from people I had a very open heart and very open mind about trying to correct a lot of the mistakes that I was making early on as a novice writer and so you do have to be it's painful but you have to open yourself up to improvement and that's really the only way that you're going to get better um, and the uh, final thing is to as hard as it is, and this is actually probably impossible and you will do this anyways, try not to compare yourself to other people because everybody's journey 
to publication, if that is their goal, is really, really different. Um, publishing houses are all different. Small publishing places, big publishing places. You know, I'm with an I'm with an Amazon imprint and a small um, and small uh, publishing houses, and I've been with big publishing houses, and they're all very, very different. I have friends who are self-published and they do incredibly well. And there's a lot of snobbishness that goes around of like, you know, are you considered a good writer or not a good writer? You know, I, I, I would very much like for people to leave that sort of high school clickiness behind and just sort of be supportive of each other and try not to be too judgy, um, including judging yourself, you know, just try to do what kind of keeps you happy. Um, and, you know, for me, it's also keep in mind that a lot of, a lot of times writing um, as much as you love it may not be enough to sustain you financially and just keep that in mind that that's um, there's a good chance that that might not happen and it doesn't happen for a lot of writers that you have to have this other job to sort of keep you going and so being also financially realistic about what you're getting into is a, a savvy thing to do so lots of advice um, <laughs> but hopefully the bottom line is that if you love it just try it and see where it takes you when you take the time to read for yourself, who are the authors and the genres that you find yourself gravitating towards? So I I read all over the place. I read a lot of, as, as a result of my um, nonfiction work and my research, I do read a lot of nonfiction. And so that just um, pops onto my lap all the time. So um, like one of my favorite like um, historical nonfiction authors is Eric Larson. I love his stuff. Um, Deborah Blum is a science writer who I absolutely adore, um, and she has written some fantastic books um, <clears throat> in the past several years. Um, one of my favorites is, um, uh, hold on, I'm going to get this name wrong, so I'm going to make sure that I say it the right way, because I tend to get things wrong in my brain. <laughs> um, Me too. Yeah, I know. I know. It's so funny. And so, yeah, so the, one of her books, the most recent one is called The Poison Squad, One Chemist Single-Minded Crusade for Food, food Safety at the um, in the 20th century, the turn of the 20th century. And then the other one that of hers that I absolutely love is The Poisoner's Handbook, Murder and the Birth of Forensic Medicine in Jazz Age New York. And it was an inspiration for me writing A Beautiful Poison. So those are two of my favorite um, nonfiction writers. Um, as far as fiction writers go, honestly, I am all over the place because I read young adult fiction. I read um, adult fiction. Um, Maureen Gu is one of my favorite young adult authors. Um, she writes these great, sometimes rom-com, like um, YA books, um, and she's a friend. Um, uh, I.W. Gregorio also writes some fantastic books as well, um, Pin Pit Done. So I mean, that, they're just three of some of my favorites. And then um, in the adult world, Sarah Fine, or, and she also writes as SF Koza, a friend, but she writes some fantastic stuff. Um, I also um, am really liking A.H. Kim and Tosca Lee, um, who both write um, thriller slash domestic thrillers sometimes. Just there's so many people out there, and, and those are people that um, some of them I actually know in person, um, so I'm probably a little bit biased. But oftentimes I will just like grab something from, you know, the top 10 list just to see if I can find out like why does everybody love this so much, you know, and just sort of listen in on that. And so I've read a lot of adult thrillers um, as a result of that, just to sort of like, you know, just get myself swept away into another story to enjoy. So lots of great stuff out there and never enough time to read is the bottom line. <laughs> never enough time to read. Mm -hmm. uh, Tosca mm -hmm. has actually been on the podcast, so I've gotten to talk to her about her last two novels that were, you know, yeah, the line between and, and the sequel. Yeah. And the sequel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So th that was a lot of fun. Um, so I know you have a website, so if you can um, tell people what your website is and how they can connect with you, maybe on social media. Sure. So um, my website is LydiaKing.com. Pretty easy. Um, there's usually, you know, an updated list of events and information about my books on there. Um, I, on social media, I'm probably the most active on Instagram, where you can find me at Lydia Kang. Um, I tend to post a lot about my puppies and food because I'm, I'm very hungry and I love cooking. So I'm constantly cooking stuff and sticking stuff on my Instagram. Um, I'm also on Twitter at Lydia Y. Uh, Kang. 
and I'm on Facebook, author Lydia King. So you can find me sort of all over the place, but probably the place that I most frequent is Instagram. Um, I tend to be a very visual person, so um, I like to, you know, um, post all sorts of interesting things in my life. And so you'll kind of get a feel for the kind of person I am by the stuff that's in there, because it's basically like dogs, books, research, um, and cooking and nature. <laughs> so that's pretty much my whole life right in there. That, that's accurate. I, I've been scrolling through your Instagram for the last couple of minutes. And <laughs> yeah, I would say also your Twitter um, bio says that you are a professional snacker. <laughs> are you being paid oh my to snack? God. I'm so jealous. I'm actually, like, as, we, as we, I wish I was paid for that. Um, like as we speak, I have like a loaf of like cream cheese bread that's like rising on my stove top. And I'm like, as soon as this interview's over, I'm going to go make some bread. So I'm like super excited about that. But um, yeah, I'm like, I love food. I can't help it. And I put food in my books all the time because I love reading about food. I think it's like super fun. <laughs> oh, and before I forget, remember I was telling you about that um, that video movie documentary about that like huge supper, like that 1899 supper. It's called Fanny's Last Supper. And I think you can find okay. it on Prime Video, but it is like basically a, a Boston feast from like well over 100 years ago made in the style of well over 100 years ago and it was just it will make you drool by the end of it but it's it was it's great but it was good fodder for writing opium and absinthe that's for sure thank you i will have to check that out um so <laughs> we have talked about a few things <laughs> but is there, is there anything that we haven't covered that you were wanting to bring up about um opium and uh, opium and, and absinthe i can't speak um or the or writing in general just anything that we haven't covered um, I don't think so. But you know what? If you have a question that I did not answer, feel free to send me a message on Instagram, on Twitter, or through my website. I'm happy to answer them. Um, also happy to like sort of chat with book clubs. And I do have book club questions on my website under the book. So if you guys do choose it as a book club, um, as a as a book selection for your club, um, I made I went through and made like a nice list of things to think about. Um, to discuss. So uh, that is on there as well. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, um, I don't, I don't want to keep you from your bread baking. So <laughs> thank you <laughs> oh, so much for taking the time to talk to me about not only opium and absence, but um, some of your other novels as well. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. Thank you once again to Lydia for joining me to talk about the new book, Opium and Absinthe, as well as um, actual opium and actual absinthe. <laughs> I, I, I love historical fiction, you know that, and I love the research that authors put into it and the, the things that they find out that, you know, don't always make it into the book, but um, I'm just... I think I could find myself, if I were an author, falling down a research rabbit hole, as many of the authors I speak to often do. Uh, I would just find so many random little facts, and then I would want to put them all in the book, and then it would be a 900-page book that nobody would want to read. <laughs> um, so thank you again to Lydia. Thank you, as always, to you, my listeners. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. I hope that you're having a good week so far. And I hope that you will join me, as always, for my next episode and my next author interview. For that interview, I am speaking with um, Phyllis Melhollow about her debut novel, The Spa at Lavender Lane. I just have to share this uh, this quote with you um, from the back of the book. This is from Charles Salzberg, award-winning author of Second Story Man, and Charles writes... Phyllis Melhaldo has written a wonderful, lively, bitchy novel populated with a cast of women, young and old, that make the real housewives look like Girl Scouts. You'll love them. You'll hate them. You'll be glad they don't live next door to you. The perfect beach read, even if there's not a beach within a hundred miles. So if that doesn't intrigue you, I don't know what will. Um, you know, unless that's not your kind of book. But that is what I will be uh, talking about. And I will be speaking with Phyllis about this book on the next episode. So join me for that. In the meantime, I hope you're having a great weekend. And uh, as always, I hope you're finding plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book or 10. Talk to you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www. 
gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program. Thank you.